two of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, Book Two. Recorded by M. L. Cohen. Jove sends a lying dream to Agamemnon, who thereon calls the chiefs in assembly and proposes to sound the mind of his army. In the end, they march to fight. Catalogue of the Achaean and Trojan Forces. Now the other gods and the armed warriors on the plain slept soundly, but Jove was wakeful, for he was thinking how to do honors to Achilles, and destroyed much people at the ships of the Achaeans. In the end, he deemed it would be best to send a lying dream to King Agamemnon, so he called one to him and said, Lying dream, go to the ships of the Achaeans, into the tent of Agamemnon, and say to him word for word as I now bid you. Tell him to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for he shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Juno has brought them to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans. The dream went when it had heard its message, and soon reached the ships of the Achaeans. It sought Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and found him in his tent, wrapped in a profound slumber. It hovered over his head in the likeness of Nestor, son of Neleus, whom Agamemnon honored above all his counselors, and said, You are sleeping, son of Atreus. One who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I come as a messenger from Jove, who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you and pities you. He bids you to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Juno has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betide the Trojans at the hand of Jove. Remember this, and when you wake, see that it does not escape you. The dream then left him, and he thought of things that were surely not to be accomplished. He thought that on the same day he was to take the city of Priam, but he knew little what was in the mind of Jove, who had many another hard-fought fight in store alike for Danans and Trojans. Then presently he woke with the divine message still ringing in his ears. So he sat upright, and put on his soft shirt so fair and new, and over this his heavy cloak. He bound his sandals onto his comely feet, and slung his silver-studded sword about his shoulders. Then he took the imperishable staff of his father, and sallied forth to the ships of the Achaeans. The goddess Dawn now wended her way to vast Olympus, that she might herald the day to Jove and to the other immortals, and Agamemnon sent the criers round to call the people in assembly. So they called them, and the people gathered thereon. But first he summoned a meeting of the elders at the ship of Nestor, king of Pylos, and when they were assembled, he laid a cunning counsel before them. My friends, said he, I have had a dream from heaven in the dead of night, and its face and figure resembled none but Nestor's. It hovered over my head and said, You are sleeping, son of Atreus. One who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I am a messenger from Jove, who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you and pities you. He bids you to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Juno has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans at the hand of Jove. Remember this. The dream then vanished, and I awoke. Let us now, therefore, arm the sons of the Achaeans. But it will be well that I should first sound them, and to this end I will tell them to fly with their ships. But do you others go about them among the host and prevent their doing so? He then sat down, and Nestor, the prince of Pylos, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus. My friends, said he, princes and counselors of the Argives, if any other man of the Achaeans had told us of this dream, we should have declared it false and would have had nothing to do with it. But he who has seen it is the foremost man among us. We must therefore set about getting the people under arms. With this he led the way from the assembly, and the other sceptred kings rose with him in obedience to the word of Agamemnon. But the people pressed forward to hear. They swarmed like bees that sally from some hollow cave and flit in countless throng among the spring flowers, bunched in knots and clusters. Even so, 
did the mighty multitude pour from ships and tents to the assembly and range themselves upon the wide-watered shore while among them ran wildfire rumor messenger of jove urging them ever to the fore thus they gathered in a pell-mell of mad confusion and the earth groaned under the tramp of men as the people sought their places nine heralds went crying about among them to stay their tumult and build them listen to the kings till at last they were got into their several places and ceased their clamor then king agamemnon rose holding his scepter this was the work of vulcan who gave it to jove the son of saturn jove gave it to mercury slayer of argus guide and guardian king mercury gave it to pelops the mighty charioteer and pelops to atreus shepherd of his people Atreus, when he died, left it to Thyestes, rich in flocks, and Thyestes, in his turn, left it to be borne by Agamemnon, that he might be the lord of all Argos and of the Isles. Leaning then on his scepter, he addressed the Argives. My friends, he said, heroes, servants of Mars, the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Cruel Jove gave me his solemn promise that I should sack the city of Priam before returning, but he has played me false, and is now bidding me go ingloriously back to Argos with the loss of much people. Such is the will of Jove, who has laid many a proud city in the dust, as he will yet lay others, for his power is above all. It will be a sorry tale hereafter that an Achaean host, at once so great and valiant, battled in vain against men fewer in number than themselves, but as yet the end is not in sight. Think that the Achaeans and Trojans have sworn to a solemn covenant, and that they have each been numbered, the Trojans by the roll of their householders, and we by companies of ten. Think further that each of our companies desired to have a Trojan householder to pour out their wine. We are so much greatly more in number than full and many company would have us go without the cup-bearer. But they have in the town allies from other places, and it is these that hinder me from being able to sack the rich city of Ilius. Nine of Jove's years are gone. The timbers of our ships have rotted. Their tackling is sound no longer. Our wives and little ones at home look anxiously for our coming. But the work that we came hither to do has not been done. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us sail back to our own land, for we shall not take Troy. With these words he moved the hearts of the multitude, so many of them as knew not the cunning counsel of Agamemnon. They surged to and fro like waves of the Icarian Sea, when the east and south winds break from heaven's cloud to lash them, or as when the west wind sweeps over a field of corn and the ears bow beneath the blast. Even so were they swayed as they flew with loud cries towards the ships, and the dust from under their feet rose heavenward. They cheered each other on to draw the ships into the sea. They cleared the channels in front of them, they began taking away the stays from underneath them, and the welkin rang with their glad cry, so eager were they to return. Then surely the Argives would have returned after a fashion that was not faded. But Juno said to Minerva, Alas, daughter of a just bearing Jove, unweariable, shall the Argives fly home to their own land over the broad sea, and leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen? for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy far from their homes? Go about at once among the host, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. Minerva was not slack to do her bidding. Down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus, and in a moment she was at the ships of the Achaeans. There she found Ulysses, peer of Jove and counsel, standing alone. He had not yet as laid a hand upon his ship, for he was grieved and sorry. So she went close up to him and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, are you going to fling yourself into your ships and be off home to your own land in this way? Will you leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their homes? Go about at once among the host, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. Ulysses knew the voice of that goddess. He flung his cloak from him and set off to run. His servant, Eurybates, a man of Ithaca, who waited on him, took charge of the cloak, whereon Ulysses went straight up to Agamemnon and received from him his ancestral and perishable staff. With this, he went about among the ships of the Achaeans. 
Whenever he met a king or chieftain, he stood by him and spoke fairly. Sir, said he, this flight is cowardly and unworthy. Stand to your post, and bid your people also keep their places. You do not yet know the full mind of Agamemnon. He was sounding us, and ere long will visit the Achaeans with his displeasure. We were not all of us at the council to hear what he then said. See to it, lest he be angry and do us a mischief. For the pride of kings is great, and the hand of Jove is with them. But when he came across any common man who was making a noise, he struck him with a staff and rebuked him, saying, Sirrah, hold your peace, and listen to better men than yourself. You are a coward and no soldier. You are nobody either in fight or counsel. We cannot all be kings. It is not well that there should be so many masters. One man must be supreme. One king to whom the son of scheming Saturn has given the scepter of sovereignty over you all. Thus masterfully did he go about among the host, and the people hurried back to the council from their tents and ships with the sound of the thunder of surf when it comes crashing down upon the shore, and all the sea is in an uproar. The rest now took their seats, and kept to their own several places, but Thersites still went on wagging his unbridled tongue. A man of many words, and those unseemly, a monger of sedition, a railer against all who were in authority, who cared not what he said, so that he might set the Achaeans in a laugh. He was the ugliest man of all those that came before Troy, bandy-legged, lame of one foot, with his two shoulders rounded and hunched over his chest. His head ran up to a point but there was little hair on top of it. Achilles and Ulysses hated him worst of all, for it was with them that he was most wont to wrangle. Now, however, with a squill, squeaky voice, he began heaping his abuse on Agamemnon. The Achaeans were angry and disgusted, yet none the less he kept on brawling and bawling at the son of Atreus. Agamemnon, he cried, what ails you now, and what more do you want? Your tents are filled with bronze and with fair women, for whenever we take the town we give you the pick of them. Would you have yet more gold, which some Trojan is to give you as ransom for his son when I or another Achaean has taken him prisoner? Or is it some young girl to hide and lie with? It is not well that you, the ruler of the Achaeans, should bring them into such misery. Weakling cowards, women rather than men, let us sail home and leave this fellow here at Troy to stew in his own meads of honor, and discover whether we were any service to him or no. Achilles is a much better man than he is, and see how he has treated him, robbing him of his prize and keeping it to himself. Achilles takes it meekly and shows no fight. If he did, son of Atreus, you would never again insult him. Thus railed Thersites, but Ulysses at once went up to him and rebuked him sternly. Check your glib tongue, Thersites, said to be, and babble not a word further. Chide not with princes when you have none to back you. There is no viler creature come before Troy with the son of Atreus. Drop this chatter about kings, and neither revile them, nor keep harping about going home. We do not yet know how things are going to be, nor whether the Achaeans are to return with good success or evil. How dare you jibe at Agamemnon because the Danans have awarded him so many prizes? I tell you, therefore, and it shall surely be, that if I again catch you talking such nonsense, I will either forfeit my own head and be called no more father of Telemachus, or I will take you, strip you stark naked, and whip you out of the assembly till you go blubbering back to the ships. On this he beat him with a staff about the back and shoulders till he dropped and fell a-weeping. The golden scepter raised the bloody wheel on his back, so he sat down frightened and in pain, looking foolish as he wiped the tears from his eyes. The people were sorry for him, yet they laughed heartily, and one would turn to his neighbor, saying, Ulysses has done many a good thing ere now in fight and counsel, but he never did the Argives a better turn than when he stopped this fellow a mouth from prattling further. He will give the kings no more of his insolence. Thus said the people. Then Ulysses rose, scepter in hand, and Minerva in the likeness of a herald bade the people be still that those who were far off might hear him and consider his counsel. He therefore with all sincerity and good will addressed them thus, King Agamemnon, the Achaeans are for making you a byword among all mankind. They forget the promise they made you when they set out from Argos, that you should not return till you had sacked the town of Troy, and, like children or widowed women, they murmur and would set off homeward. True, it is that they have had toil enough to be disheartened. A man chafes at having to stay away from his wife either for a single month, when he's on shipboard, at the mercy of wind and sea. But now it is nine long years that we have been kept here. 
I cannot therefore blame the Achaeans if they turn restive. Still, we shall be shamed if we go home empty after so long a stay. Therefore, my friends, be patient yet a little longer that we may learn whether the prophecyings of Calchas were false or true. All who have not since Paris must remember, as though it were yesterday or the day before, how the ships of the Achaeans were destined in Aulis, while we are on our way hither to make war on Priam and the Trojans. We were ranged about a fountain offering hecatombs to the gods upon their holy altars, and there was a fine plane tree from beneath where would well the stream of pure water. Then we saw a prodigy, for Jove sent a fearful serpent out of the ground with blood rent stains upon his back, and it darted from under the altar onto the plane tree. Now there was a brood of young sparrows, quite small upon the topmost bough, peeping out from under the leaves, eight in all, and their mother that hatched made them nine. The serpent ate the poor cheeping things, while the old bird flew about lamenting her little ones, but the serpent threw his coils about her and caught her by the wing as she was screaming. Then, when he had eaten both the sparrow and her young, the god who had sent him made him become a sign, for the son of scheming Saturn turned him into stone, and we stood wondering at that which had come to pass. Seeing then that such a fearful potent had broken upon our hecatombs, Calchas forwith declared to us the oracles of heaven. Why, Achaeans, said he, are you thus speechless? Jove has sent us this sign, long in coming and long ere it be fulfilled, though its fame shall last for ever. As the serpent ate the eight fledglings and the sparrow that hatched them, which makes nine, so shall we fight nine years at Troy, but in the tenth shall take the town. This was what he said, and now it is all coming true. Stay here, therefore, all of you, till we take the city of Priam. On this the Argive raised a shout till the ships rang again with the uproar. Nestor, knight of Gerene, then addressed them. Shame on you, he cried, to stay here talking like children when you should fight like men. Where are our covenants now, and where are the oaths that we have taken? Shall our counsels be flung into the fire with our drink offerings at the right hands of fellowships wherein we are put our trust? We waste our time in words, and for all our talking here shall be no further forward. Stand, therefore, son of Atreus, by your own steadfast purpose. Lead the Argives on to battle, and leave this handful of men to rot, who scheme and scheme in vain to get back to Argos, ere they have learned whether Jub be true or liar. For the mighty son of Saturn surely promised that we should succeed, and when we Argives set sail to bring death and destruction upon the Trojans, he showed us favorable signs by flashing his lightning on our right hands. Therefore, let none make haste to go till he has first lain with the wife of some Trojan, and avenge the toil and sorrow that he has suffered for the sake of Helen. Nevertheless, if any man is in such haste to be at home again, let him lay his hand to his ship that he may meet his doom in the sight of all. But, O king, consider and give ear to my counsel, for the word that I say may not be neglected lightly. Divide your men, Agamemnon, into the several tribes and clans, that clans and tribes may stand by and help one another. If you do this, and if the Achaeans obey you, you will find out who both chiefs and people are brave, and who are cowards for they will vie against the other. Thus you shall also learn whether it is through the counsel of heaven or the cowardice of man that you shall fail to take the town. And Agamemnon answered, Nestor, you have again outdone the sons of the Achaeans in counsel. Would by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo that I had among them ten more such counselors, for the city of King Priam would then soon fall beneath our hands and we should sack it. But the son of Saturn afflicts me with bootless wranglings and strife. Achilles and I are quarreling about this girl, in which matter I was the first to offend. If we can be of one mind again, the Trojans will not stave off destruction for a day. Now, therefore, get your morning meal, that our host join us in fight. Wet well your spears, see well to the ordering of your shields, give good feeds to your horses, and look your chariots carefully over, that we may do battle the live long day, for we shall have no rest not for a moment, till night falls to part us. The bands that bear your shield shall be wet with the sweat upon your shoulders, your hands shall be weary upon your spears, your horses shall steam in front of your chariots, and if I see any man shirking the fight, or trying to keep out of it at ships, there shall be no help for him, but he shall be prey to dogs and vultures. Thus he spoke, and the Achaeans roared applause. As when the waves run high before the blast of the south wind and break on some lofty headland, dashing against it and buffeting without ceasing, as the storms from every quarter drive them, 
Even so did the Achaeans rise and hurry in all directions to their ships. Then they lighted their fires at their tents and got dinner, offering sacrifice every man to one or other of the gods and praying each one of them that he might live to come out of the fight. Agamemnon, king of men, sacrificed a fat five-year-old bull to the mighty son of Saturn and invited the princes and elders of his host. First he asked Nestor and King Idomeneus, then the two Ajaxes and the son of Tydes, and sixthly Ulysses, peer of gods in council. But Menelaus came of his own accord, for he knew how busy his brother was then. They stood round the bowl with the barley meal in their hands, and Agamemnon prayed, saying, Jove, most glorious, supreme, that dwellest in heaven and ridest upon the storm cloud, grant that the sun may not go down, nor the night fall, till the palace of Priam is laid low, and its gates are consumed with fire. Grant that my sword may pierce the shirt of Hector about his heart, and that full many of his comrades may bite the dust as they fall dying round him. Thus he prayed, but the son of Saturn would not fulfill his prayer. He accepted the sacrifice, yet none the less increased their toil continually. When they had done praying and sprinkling the barley meal upon the victim, they drew back its head, killed it, and then flayed it. They cut out the thigh bones, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, and set pieces of raw meat on top of them. These they burned upon the split logs of firewood, but they spitted the inward meats and held them to the flame to cook. When the thigh bones were burned and they had tasted the inward meats, they cut the rest up small, put the pieces upon the spits, roasted them till they were done, and drew them off. Then, when they had finished their work and the feast was ready, they ate of it, and every man had his full share so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Nestor, knight of Gerene, began to speak. King Agamemnon, said he, let us not stay talking here, nor be slack in the work that heaven has put into our hands. Let the heralds summon the people to gather at their several ships. We will then go about among the hosts that we may begin fighting at once. Thus did he speak, and Agamemnon heeded his words. He at once sent the criers round to call the people in assembly. So they called them and the people gathered thereon. The chiefs about the son of Atreus chose their men and marshaled them, while Minerva went among them, holding her priceless aegis that knows neither age nor death. From it there waved a hundred tassels of pure gold, all deftly woven, and each one of them worth a hundred oxen. With this she darted furiously everywhere among the host of the Achaeans, urging them forward and putting courage into the heart of each, though they might fight and do battle without ceasing. Thus war became sweeter in their eyes even than returning home in their ships. As when some great forest fire is raging upon a mountain top and its light is seen afar, even so as they marched the gleam of their armor flashed up the firmament of heaven. They were like great flocks of geese or cranes or swans on the plain about the waters of Caister that winged their way hither and thither, glorying in the pride of flight and crying as they settled to the fen is alive with their screaming. Even thus, did the tribes pour from the ships and tents on the plan of Scamander, and the ground rang as brass under the feet of men and horses. They stood as thick upon the flower-bespangled field as leaves that bloom in summer. As countless swarms of flies buzz round a herdsman homestead in a time of spring when pails are drenched with milk, even so did the Achaeans swarm on the plain to charge the Trojans and destroy them. The chiefs disposed their men this way and that before the fight began, drafting them out as easily as goat herds draft their flocks when they have got mixed while feeding. And among them when King Agamemnon, with a head and face like Jove the Lord of Thunder, a waist like Mars and a chest like that of Neptune. As some great bull that lords it over the herds upon the plain, even so did Jove make the son of Atreus down peerless among the multitude of heroes. And now, O muses, dwellers in the mansions of Olympus, tell me, for you are the goddesses and are all places so that you see all things, while we know nothing but by report. Who were the chiefs and princes of the Danans? As for the common soldiers, they were so that I could not name every single one of them, though I had ten tongues, and though my voice failed not and my heart were bronze within me, unless you, O Olympian muses, daughters of the Aegis-bearing Jove, were to recount them to me. Nevertheless, I will tell the captains of the ships and all the fleet together. Penelos, Laetes, Arcaselius, Prothonor, and Clonius were the captains of the Bothians. These were they that dwelt in Hyria and Rocky Aulis, who held Shonus, Scolus, and the highlands of Etonius, with Thespia, Greia, and the fair city of Mycalasus. They also held Harma, Elysium, and Erythrae, 
and they had Elion Hyle and Pition, Ocelia and the strong fortress of Medion, Copia, Eutresis, and Thisbe, the haunt of doves, Coronia and the pastures of Haliartus, Platea and Glissus, the fortress of Thebes the less, Holy on Kestis with his famous grome of Neptune, Arne and rich in vineyards, Medea sacred Nisa, and Anthedon upon the sea. From these came the fifty ships, and in each there were a hundred and twenty young men of the Bothians. Ascalaphus and Iamus, son of Mars, led the people that dwell in Esplendon and Orchomenus, the realm of Minus. Astiochi, a noble maiden, bore them in the house of Actor, son of Asius, for she had gone with Mars secretly into an upper chamber, and he had lain with her. With these there came thirty ships. The Phocians were led of Saedus and Epistrophus, son of Mudiaphetus, the son of Nabulus. These were those that truly held Cyparissus, Rocky Pytho, Holy Chrysa, Daulis, and Panopius. They also that dwelt in Anamora and Hyampolis, and about the waters of the river Cephasus, and Laleia by the springs of Cephasus. With their chieftains came forty ships, and they marshaled the forces of the Phocians, which were stationed next to the Boeotians on their left. Ajax, the fleet son of Oileus, commanded the Locrians. He was not so great, nor nearly so great, as Ajax the son of Telamon. He was a little man, and his breastplate was made of linen but in use of the spear he excelled all the Hellenes and the Achaeans. These dwelt in Sinus, Opius, Calarius, Bessa, Scarfe, Fair Algiae, Tarfe, and Thronium about the river Bogrius. With him there came forty ships of the Locrians who dwelt beyond Euboea. The fierce Abantes held Euboea with its cities, Chalcis, Eritrea, Histea, rich in vines, Cerinthes upon the rock in the rock-perched town of Diam. With them were also men of Charistus, and Styra. Elephinior of the race of Mars was his command of these. He was son of Chalcodon and chief over all the Abantes. With him they came, fleet of foot and wearing their hair long behind, brave warriors who would ever strive to tear open the corslets of their foes with their long ashen spears. Of these there came fifty ships. And they that held the strong city of Athens, the people of great Erechtheus, who were born of the soil itself but Jove's daughter, Minerva fostered him and established him at Athens in her own rich sanctuary. There, year by year, the Athenian youths worshipped him with sacrifices of bulls and rams. These were commanded by Menestheus, son of Pedios. No man living could equal him in marshalling of chariots and foot soldiers. Nestor could alone rival him, for he was older. With him there came fifty ships. Ajax bought twelve ships from Salamis and stationed them alongside those of the Athenians. The men of Argos, again, and those who held the wall of Tyrenes with Hermione and a sign upon the gulf, Trozene, Iliane, and the vineyard lands of Epidaurus the Achaean youth, moreover, who came from Aegina and Masses, these were led by Diomed of the law of battle cry, and Stenisthenes, son fame of Capaneus. With them in command was Euralius, son of King Mesedus, son of Talus, but Diomed was chief over them all. With these there came eighty ships. Those who held the strong city of Mycenae, rich Corinth and Cleonthe, Ornea, Arathea, and Lycion, where Adrastus reigned of old, Hyperesia, Hygonessa, and Pellene, Aegeum and all the coastland round about the Hellas, these sent a hundred ships under the command of King Agamemnon, son of Atreus. His force was far both finest and most numerous, and in their midst was the king himself, all glorious in his armor of gleaming bronze, foremost among the heroes, for he was the greatest king and had the most men under him. And those that dwelt in Lacedaemon, lying low among the hills, Pharis, Sparta with Messi, the haunt of doves, Brysiae, Augiae, Amicle, and Helos upon the sea, Laius, moreover, and Odalus, these were led by Menelaus of the loud battle cry, brother to Agamemnon, and of them there were sixty ships drawn apart from the others. Among them went Menelaus himself, strong in zeal, urging his men to fight, for he longed to avenge the toil and sorrow that he had suffered for the sake of Helen. The men of Pylos and Arene and Thurium were at the ford of the river Alpheus, strong Ap, Cyparesis, and Amphigenea. Tilium, Helos, and Dorium, where the muses met Thrymius, and stilled as minstrelly for ever. He was returning from Ocalalia, where Eutrius lived, and reigned and boasted that he would surpass even the muses, daughters of Aegis bearing Jove, if they should sing against him, whereon they were angry and maimed him. They robbed him of his divine power of song, and thenceforth he could strike the lyre no more. These were commanded by Nestor, knight of Gerene, and with him there came ninety ships. 
and those that held Arcadia under the high mountain of Silene near the tomb of Aeptus, where the people fight hand to hand, the men of Phineas also, and Orchomenus rich in flocks, of Ripe Stridae, the bleak of Anispa, of Tagia and fair Mantinea, of Stymphialus and Parhasa, of these King Agepnor, son of Anseus, was commander, and they had sixty ships. Many Arcadians, good soldiers, came in each one of them, but Agamemnon found them the ships in which to cross the sea, for they were not a people that occupied their business upon the waters. The men, moreover, of Euprasium and of Elis, so much of it is enclosed between Hermene and Myrcenus upon the seashore, the rock of Olene and Elysium. These had four leaders, and each of them had ten ships, with many Epeans on board. Their captains were Amphimarchus and Thelipius, the one son of Cetaceus and the other of Eurytus, both of the race of Actor. The two others were Diorus, son of Amarynces, and Polyxenus, son of King Agasthenes, son of Augeus. And those of Dulcium were the sacred Achaean islands who dwelt beneath the sea off Elis. These were led by Megis, peer of Mars, and the son of valiant Phileus, dear to Jove, who quarreled with his father and went to settle in Dulcurium. With him there came forty ships. Ulysses led the brave Cephalanians, who held Ithaca, Neridum with his forest, Crocalia, rugged Egyptus, Samos, and Zacnius, with the mainland also that was over against the islands. These were led by Ulysses, peer of Jove and council, and with them there came twelve ships. Thoas, son of Andramion, commanded the Aetolians, who dwelled in Pleuron only as Pylene, Chalcis by the sea, and rocky Calydon, for the great king Oneus had now no sons living, and was himself dead, as was also the golden-haired Melager, who had been sent over the Aetolians to be their king. And with Thoas there came forty ships. The famous spearsman Idomeneus led the Cretans, who held Croesus, and the well-walled city of Gordus, Lytus also, Miletus and Lycastus that lies upon the chalk, the populous town of Phaestus and Rhydium, with all the other peoples that dwell in the hundred cities of Crete. All these were led by Idomeneus and by Merionis, peer of murderous Mars, and with these there came eighty ships. Tlepolemus, son of Hercules, a man both brave and large of stature, bought nine ships of lordly warriors from Rhodes. These dwelt in Rhodes, which is divided among the three cities of Lindus, Aeusius, and Camerinus, that lie upon the chalk. These were commanded by Tlepolemus, son of Hercules by Astiochia, whom he had carried off from Ephyria on the river Celius after sacking many cities of valiant warriors. When Telepimus grew up, he killed his father's uncle Lysimeneus, who had been a famous warrior in his time, but was then grown old. On this he built himself a fleet, gathered the great following, and fled beyond the sea, for he was menaced by the other sons and grandsons of Hercules. After a voyage during which he suffered great hardship, he came to Rhodes, where the people divided into three communities according to their tribes, and were dearly loved by Jove, the lord of gods and men. Wherefore the son of Saturn showered down great riches upon them. And Nereus bought three ships from Syme. Nereus, who was the handsomest man that came up under Ilius of all the Danans after the son of Peleus, but he was a man of no substance, and had but a small following. And those that held Nisyrus, Crapathus, and Cassus with cost, the city of Euripolis, and the Chaldinian islands, these were commanded by Phidippus and Antiphus, two sons of King Thessalus, the son of Hercules. And with them there came thirty ships. Those again who held Pelagasic, Argos, Alos, Alopi, and Trachus, and those of Phythiath and Hellas, the land of fair women, who were called the Myrmidons, Hellenes, and Achaeans, these had fifty ships, over which Achilles was in command. But now they took no part in the war, inasmuch as there was no one to marshal them for Achilles stayed by his ships, furious about the loss of the girl Briseis, whom he had taken from Lernesis at his own great peril, when he had sacked Lernesis and Thebe and had overthrown Minus and Epithestrophus, son of King Evanor, son of Selipus. For her sake Achilles was still grieving, but ere long he was again to join them. And those that held Flace in the flowery meadows of Persiris, sanctuary of Ceres, Iton, the mother of sleep, Antrum upon the sea, and Tilium that lies upon the grasslands, of these brave Protesilius had been captain while he was yet alive, but he was now lying under the earth. He had left the wife behind him in Phylace to tear her cheeks in sorrow, and his house was only half finished, for he was slain by a Dardanian warrior while leaping foremost of the Achaeans upon the soil of Troy. Still, 
Though his people mourned their chieftain, they were not without a leader. For Podorices, the race of Mars, marshaled them. He was son of Iphiclus, rich in sheep, who was the son of Phylacius, and he was own brother to Protesalius, only younger. Protesalius being at once the elder and more valiant. So the people were not without a leader, though they mourned him whom they had lost. With him there came forty ships. And those that held Fury by the Bobian Lank, with Bobi, Glaphyri, and the populous city of Iolcus, those with their eleven ships were led by Eumelius, son of Adametius, with Alcestes bore to him, loveliest of the daughters of Peleus. And those that held Methone and Thaumatia, with Melobia and rugged Olazon, these were led by the skillful archer Philoctetes, and they had seven ships, each with fifty oarsmen, all of them good archers, but Philoctetes was lying in great pain in the island of Lemnos, where the sons of the Achaeans left him for he had been bitten by a poisonous water-snake. There he lay, sick and sorry, and full soon did the Argives come to miss him. But his people, though they felt his loss, were not leaderless, for Medon, the bastard son of Oileus by rain, set them in array. Those again, of Tricca and the stony region of Ithome, and they that held Ocalius, the city of Ocalian Eurythus, these were commanded by the two sons of Asclepius, skilled in the art of healing. Podalirius and Machion, and with them came thirty ships. The men, moreover, of Ormenius, and by the fountain of Hyperia, with those that held Asterius and the white crest of Titanus, these were led by Eurypylus, the son of Eumaeon, and with them there came forty ships. Those that held Agrissa and Gytone, or Theolone, the whelp city of Ulusan, of those brave Pelopodes was the leader. He was the son of Perithius, who was the son of Jove himself, for Hippodamia bore him to Perithius on the day when he took his revenge on the shaggy mountain savages, and drove them from Mount Pelion to the Ianthes. But Polypedius was not sole in command, for with him was Leontius, of the race of Mars, who was son of Coronis, the son of Canius, and with these there came forty ships. Gunaeus bought two and twenty ships from Cyphus, and he was followed by the Munes and the valiant Parabi, who dwelt about the wintry Dodona, and held the lands round the lovely river of Titarius, which sends its waters into the Peneus. They do not mingle with the silver eddies of the Peneus, but flow on top of them like oil. For the Tartaresius is a branch of dread Orcus and of the river Styx. Of the Magnetes, Prothus, son of Tethrodon, was commander. They were they that dwelt about the river Peneus and Mount Pelion. Prothos, fleet of foot, was their leader, and with them there came forty ships. Such were the chiefs and princes of the Danans. Who then, O Muse, was the foremost, whether man or horse, among those that followed after the sons of Atreus? Of the horses, those of the son of fairies were by far the finest. They were driven by Eumelus and were fleet as birds. They were the same age and color, and perfectly matched in height. Apollo, of the silver bow, had bred them in Perea, both of them mares and terrible as Mars in battle. Of men, Ajax, son of Telamon, was much the foremost, so long as Achilles' anger lasted, for Achilles excelled him greatly when he also had better horses. But Achilles was now holding aloof at his ships by reason of his quarrel with Agamemnon, and his people passed their time upon the seashore, throwing discs or aiming with spears at Mark, and in archery. Their horses stood each by his own chariot, champing lotus and wild celery. The chariots were housed under cover, but their owners, for lack of leadership, wandered hither and thither about the host, and went not forth to fight. Thus marched the host like a consuming fire, and the earth groaned beneath them when the lord of thunder is angry and lashes about the land of Typhoeus among the Arimi, where they say Typhoeus lies. Even so did the earth groan beneath them as they sped over the plain. And now Iris, fleet as the wind, was sent by Jove to tell the bad news among the Trojans. They were gathered in assembly, old and young, at Priam's gates, and Iris came close up to Priam, speaking with the voice of Priam's son Polites, who, being fleet of foot, was stationed as watchman for the Trojans on the tome of old Aestes, to look out for any sally of the Achaeans. In his likeness Iris spoke, saying, Old man, you talk idly, as in times of peace, while war is at hand. I have been in many a battle, but never yet saw such a host as is now advancing. They are crossing the plain to attack the city as thick as leaves or as the sands of the sea. Hector, I charge you above all, others, do as I say. There are many allies dispersed about the city of Priam from distant places and speaking diverse tongues. Therefore, let each chief give orders to his own people. 
setting them severally in array and leading them forth to battle. Thus she spoke, but Hector knew that it was the goddess, and at once broke up the assembly. The men flew to arms, all the gates were open, and the people thronged through them, horse and foot, with a tramp as of a great multitude. Now there is a high mound before the city, rising by itself upon the plain. Men called it Bataia, but the gods know that it is the tomb of Lyth Myrnin. Here the Trojans and their allies divided their forces. Priam's son, great Hector of the gleaming helmet, commanded the Trojans, and with him were arrayed by far the greatest number and most valiant of those who were longing for the fray. The Dardanians were led by brave Aeneas, whom Venus bore to Anchises when she, goddess though she was, had lain with him upon the mountain slopes of Ida. He was not alone, for with him were the two sons of Antenor, Acacolochus and Acamas, both skilled in the arts of war. They that dwelt in Telia under the lowest spurs of Mount Ida, men of substance who drank the limpid waters of the Sippus, and are of Trojan blood. These were led by Pandarus, son of Lycaon, whom Apollo had taught to use the bow. They that held Adrastea at the land of Apicius with Pythidia in the high mountain of Terea, these were led by Adrestus and Amphius, whose breastplate was of linen. These were the sons of Merops of Percote, who excelled in all kinds of divination. He told them not to take part in the war, but they gave him no heed, for fate lured them to destruction. They that dwelt about Percote and Practius with Cestos, Albidos, and Arispe, these were led by Asius, son of Hercticus, a brave commander. Asius, the son of Hercticus, whom his powerful dark bay steeds of the breed that comes from the river Celius had brought from Arisbe. Hippothos led the tribes of Pelagsian spearmen, who dwelt in fertile Larissa. Hippothos and Pileus of the race of Mars, two sons of Pelasgian Lethus, son of Teutimus. Acamas and the warriors Pyrrhus commanded the Thracians and those that came from beyond the mighty stream of the Hellespont. Euphemus, son of Troesius, the son of Ceos, was captain of the Ceronian spearmen. Pyrachemes led the Paeonian archers from distant Amidon by the broad waters of the river Axius, the fairest that flow upon the earth. The Palphagonians were commanded by stout hardest Pylemaeus from Ente, where the mules run wild in herds. These were they that held Cytorus in the country road round Sesamus, with the cities by the river Parthenius, Cromna, Aegilus, and lofty Erythini. Odius and Epistrophus were captains over the Halzoni from distant Alibi, where there are mines of silver. Chromus and Enimus, the augur, led the Mycians. But his skill in augury availed him not to save him for destruction, for he fell by the hand of the fleet descendant of Achaeus in the river, where he slew other of the Trojans. Phorcys, again, and noble Ascanius led the Phrygians from the far country of Ascania, and both were eager for the fray. Mesthes and Antiphus commanded the Meonians, son of Talamenes, born to him of the Gideon Lake. These led the Meonians, who dwelt under Mount Tmolus. Nastes led the Carians, men of strange speech. These held Miletus in the wooded mountain of Phytheres, with the water in the river Melander and the lofty crest of Mount Mycali. These were commanded by Nastes and Amphimachus, brave son of Nomion. He came into the fight with gold about him like a girl, fooled that he was. His gold was no avail to save him, for he fell in the river by the hand of the fleet descendant of Achaeus, and Achilles bore away his gold. Sarpedon and Glaucus led the Lycians from their distant land by the eddying waters of Xanthus. End of Book 2. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio. www.mojomove411.com.